So there's Stephen in the midst of the lion's den, the Sanhedrin all around him, their teeth literally grinding because of their anger. They are salivating for Stephen's blood. This morning we are in Acts chapter 7, verse 1 down through verse 60. And really the section, as was indicative of the passage we just read, the section begins in chapter 6, verse 8. And I wanted to read chapter 6, verse 8 through 15 to give you that context of, of where we're going this morning. Because Stephen, if you remember from the first uh, seven verses of Acts chapter 6, Steve, Stephen was one of those seven Hellenistic men who was chosen within the church, full of the Holy Spirit, full of wisdom, because there was a need that rose up in the church. And so Stephen was one of those seven who was appointed, and he was ministering to those Hellenistic, the Greek-speaking widows in the church, and that need was met. But Stephen was not just serving in that way. Stephen was also a preacher and Stephen was mightily filled with the Holy Spirit and so it tells us that Stephen was speaking boldly and he was working all sorts of signs and wonders because he's full of the Holy Spirit and wouldn't you know that that message about Jesus would irritate the very men who oversaw the crucifixion of Jesus we will affirm this morning the message of Jesus and I want to give that to you very clearly here this morning because I'm, I'm certain that there are people who are with us who have never heard about the love of Jesus for them and I want to make that crystal clear for you this morning. We believe the Bible teaches us, history affirms this, the preaching of the apostles affirms this just as well and this was the testimony of Jesus, that Jesus Christ of Nazareth was born of a woman, sent by God, born of a woman, the perfect son of God. He's born into the world, he lives a sinless life and Jesus died on the cross he died a criminal's death, though he was without sin. So that people like us who have sinned against God, he can take our sin, he can take that, that certificate of debt, and he can nail it on the cross. God doesn't sweep our sins under the rug to forget them. God nails them to the cross on his son Jesus, and God thereby pays our penalty for us. So if you come to Jesus, Jesus can forgive you of your sins because he's paid your penalty. That's the good news of the gospel, but it doesn't end there. Because Jesus not only overcame our debt of sin that we, we can't pay, Jesus not only overcame that, but we know that Jesus was raised from the dead three days later. So Jesus conquers sin, and Jesus also conquers death. And Jesus gives eternal life, everlasting life, to those who are his. That is the good news of the gospel given to everybody in the world, if you will, but by faith. Believe in the Lord Jesus and begin to follow him. God will forgive you and he'll give you everlasting life. And that is the message that Stephen was preaching. And when Stephen preached that message, it was affirmed by the power of God working through him as he heals all manner of sickness, casts out demons, works signs and wonders in the people's sight there. The word is affirmed that he is preaching. And so the Sanhedrin, they are irritated by this. The Jews who had gathered, it tells us earlier there in chapter 6, verse 8 through 15, that there were certain men of the synagogue of the freedmen. That was people who had come from all around the Mediterranean Sea. All the way from the, the northmost central part of Egypt all the way to the, the northern end of the Mediterranean just south of Rome and Jews had come from all over these lands. They had been dispersed because of persecution and difficulties in life. These were people born out of opposition, born in difficulty and they have moved back from these uh, lands abroad and they've come back to Jerusalem and these people have joined together in a synagogue. And they don't love Jesus because in their estimation, Jesus was trying to destroy Judaism. They did not see Jesus rightly as the fulfillment of everything that the Old Testament speaks. And so they rebelled against Jesus. They oversaw the crucifixion of Jesus and they hated Stephen and they hated his preaching as well as the apostles because they testified to Jesus. And so they come upon Stephen as he's preaching, performing signs, they seize him, they arrest him, and and then they take him to the council. That word for council is the word sunedrion. It's where we get our word Sanhedrin. That was the 70 elders of Israel. This was the supreme court of Jerusalem, of the Jews. And so they are gathered there 
when the Sanhedrin meets and you have these 70 chairs, these 70 thrones there in a circle and you have Stephen, lowly Stephen, standing there in the midst of that den of lions. But Stephen is not alone. God is with him. Stephen is filled with the Holy Spirit. God will be with us in our darkest days, in our days of difficulty and oppression. And we can stand firm on that truth. And so Stephen has these accusations leveled against him. Just as these men had done to Jesus not some time before that, they had amassed false witnesses who said lies of Stephen because they want him put to death. They want him silenced. And you look here at the end of chapter six and you see those false accusations that are leveled against Stephen. It's important for us to grasp them because if you grasp the, the false accusations, you can see why Stephen says what he does in chapter seven. So look at the end of chapter six with me in your Bible. It says that they secretly, verse 11, Acts six, they secretly instigated men who said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. When they say that he spoke blasphemous words against Moses, they're talking about the Old Testament. They're talking about the Bible, the books of the law. And they're saying he is maligning scripture. He's speaking evil against it, saying that it's not worth following. And because he is maligning the word of Moses, he is maligning the words of God. He is blaspheming God. That was a crime punishable by death. That was a capital offense, but it goes on. It says that when they bring him to the council, to the Sanhedrin, verse 13, they set up false witnesses who said, they exaggerate here, don't they? This man never ceases to speak words against this holy place. They're talking about the temple and the law talking about the Bible. This man stands antithetically to the temple where we worship Yahweh and he stands against the Bible that we stand upon. That's what they are saying about themselves and that's what they are saying against Stephen. He stands and preaches against everything we know to be right. Stephen's going to answer them here in a moment and show them that the law that they say they stand upon, they and their fathers before them from the beginning rebelled against the law. They rebelled against God and they are accusing him of the very thing that they did and their fathers did. He never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. They're saying this Jesus that he's talking about, Jesus said he would destroy the temple that we worship in. And if he destroys the temple, where are we going to worship God? Because the temple is central to what we do. The temple is central to our worship of God. So what do we do? We need to put Stephen to death. So it says here in chapter 7, verse 1, And the high priest said, Are these things so? He's going to give Stephen an opportunity to defend himself. Stephen has no lawyer, but he is going to uh, mount up a defense for himself against the prosecution against him. So they think, and it says in verse 2, look at it with me. And Stephen said, Brothers, and fathers, hear me. One of the things that you will notice throughout Stephen's sermon here is Stephen shows respect to these men, to these 70 elders. He calls them fathers. Fathers, I show you respect. I show you deference. I show you honor. It's likely Stephen was younger than most of these men, and he shows them honor, and he shows them respect. And he also calls them brothers. You will notice throughout this sermon until the very end when the sermon takes a drastic spin, Stephen shows that these men are his brothers. They are alike in every way except one, except the most important, and that is faith and submission to the Holy Spirit. They are alike. They come from the same father, Father Abraham. They come from the same patriarchs. They came from the people, the same people. Their people endured the same experiences, but they endured it differently, one by faith and one by rebellion. So Stephen says, brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father. See how he shows unity? Our father. He appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia. 
before he lived in Haran. Now, Mesopotamia is right there near the tip of the Persian Gulf. So if you see the Mediterranean Sea and you see Israel right here, over here is the Persian Gulf. And you have the Tigris and Euphrates that dump into the Persian Gulf. That is where Abram started. His name was Abraham, Abram then, before God changed his name to Abraham. But he started out in a little old town called Ur of the Chaldees. It was a very wealthy town. That's where Abraham started, south of Babylon, right there near the shores of the Persian Gulf. Gulf. You see, Abraham started far away. He started far away from Israel, far away from where the temple would later be built. And what you'll see that Stephen is going to show them is that God is not restricted. His presence is not restricted to the temple. God's presence is not restricted to the temple. God is with people of faith. And so he's with Abram here in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. And said to him, verse 3, Go out from your land and from your kindred to go into the land that I will show you. How's that for a call to faith? Pack up your house. Start driving down the road. I'm not going to tell you where I'm taking you, but I promise you, I'll get you there. That's a call to faith. That's the very same call that God issues to us in our lives. God's not going to tell you exactly where he's going to take you other than to say, if you trust in me, I will guarantee you everlasting life, forgiveness of sins, and heaven eternally with my son, Jesus. He won't tell you exactly the path you're, the path you're going to take to get there, but he promises that he will be with you the entire way. Abram believed God. Abram followed God. God changed him, and he changed his name to Abraham. Abraham is the father of all who believe. You and I can be like Abraham if we will believe in God and we will not resist his call to believe. So it says in verse 4, what did Abraham do? Then he went out from the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran. And after this, his father died. God removed him from there into this land in which you are now living. So God had brought Abraham all the way from Mesopotamia up to Haran, a region just north of Damascus, and then he brings him right down there to the land of Canaan, to the promised land. Verse 5, yet he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot's length, but promised to give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him, though he had no child. Would you endure in faith in that kind of call? God promised you a land flowing with milk and honey. God gave you a promised land, but you never actually laid hold of a single foot of possession in it. He promised to make your descendants as numerous as the star of the sky. Abraham was 100 years old before he had Isaac. Would you hold on that long? Would you wave your fist at heaven and say, God, you promised me, where are you at? Abraham didn't do that. Why? Because Abraham was a man of faith. Abraham believed the Lord, just like we're called to. And it says in verse 6, And God spoke to this effect, that his offspring would be sojourners in a land belonging to others, who would enslave them and afflict them for 400 years. What is he talking about? He's talking about Egypt, isn't he? He's talking about Egypt, how God would raise up Abram's descendants. He would take them into Egypt, and they would live there for a little over 400 years. And at the end of that time, God would bring them out as a mighty nation. Verse 7, but I will judge the nation that they serve, said God. And after that, they shall come out and worship me in this place. So was God still with Abram all the way in Mesopotamia, in Haran, in the promised land, and now his descendants in Egypt? Was God with them everywhere? Yes, he was. Because God's presence is not restricted by geography. Verse 8, and he gave him the covenant of circumcision. He gave Moses, or Abram, the law in that sense. And so Abraham became the father of Isaac. And circumcised him on the eighth day, and Isaac became the father of Jacob, and of Jake and Jacob of the twelve patriarchs. You see what Stephen is doing here? Their accusation against him is that he holds God's word in disdain. 
He wants to do away with the words of Moses. He wants to do away with the words of God. But Stephen, right off the bat, he begins affirming everything about the history of Israel as it's recorded there in Scripture. He shows God deference. He shows him respect and honor. He is so far from blaspheming the name of God. And one thing that I want you to notice while we go through this, the Bible doesn't tell us that, that Stephen even had a Bible in his hand. It doesn't tell us that Stephen had a scroll in his hand. The Lord knows he would have had to have a number of scrolls. If you go through this and you reference it out, all of the textual references he gives, he would have had to have so many scrolls in his hand, it would have been impossible. So you know what Stephen is doing while he's preaching this sermon? He is reciting passage after passage of the Old Testament from memory. He gives nearly the entire history of Israel from inception to the coming of Christ. He gives it off the top of his head and heart. How did Stephen do that? Two things. One, Stephen hid God's word in his heart. Stephen had to have spent time in the Bible. He had to have spent time studying God's word. In the second way, in his moment of difficulty and opposition, the Holy Spirit was near to him just as he promised. And the Holy Spirit reminded him of the things that he had studied. Now, I don't say this by way of condemnation. I say it by way of exhortation and encouragement to encourage you in the word. If I were to ask you or somebody were to pull you off in a store and say, could you tell me the history of what you believe? Could you tell me how your faith began? I mean, start from the beginning. How did Christianity come about? How did God move in those early years? And could you tell me all the way up till now? Would you be able to? Don't raise your hand. Would you be able to give a history? You know why we can't do that most of the time? It's because we haven't spent adequate time in God's Word. Again, I don't say that by way of condemnation. I say it by way of exhortation to encourage you because in that moment of difficulty, in that moment of trial, when you come to it, you will be glad that you spent that time in God's Word. When the Holy Spirit begins to remind you as you're having that conversation there at work or there at school and you are sharing your faith with somebody and the Holy Spirit reminds you of that passage you studied and that passage you studied and the Lord works out something great right there in your midst. I want to encourage you to spend time in God's Word. Spend time in the Bible. Continue looking here at verse 9. He's going to move. Stephen's going to move from speaking about Abraham. He's now talked about Isaac. Now God gave Abraham Isaac, and now he gave to Isaac Jacob, and then the 12 patriarchs. Those are the 12 sons of Jacob, who is also known as Israel. In verse 9, it says, and the patriarchs, that's their fathers. When he says that phrase, the patriarchs, he's saying, and your fathers... From the beginning, what do they do? And the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph. They're not doing something righteous here. They're doing something unrighteous at the word of God. They're jealous of Joseph because Joseph has received the word of the Lord. He dreamed those dreams. And so his brothers, their fathers, the Sanhedrin's fathers, they rebelled against Joseph. And the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, verse 9, sold him into Egypt. But God was with him. God was with Joseph even in Egypt. God can be with you anywhere if you'll just trust in him. But God was with him, verse 10, and rescued him out of all his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who made him ruler over Egypt and over all his household. Now there came a famine throughout all Egypt and Canaan and great affliction, and our fathers, there he does it again, showing his unity with them, and our fathers could find no food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, you mean the blessings of God are outside of Israel just as well? Yes, they are. And when Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers on their first visit. And on the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. And Joseph sent and summoned Jacob, his father, and all his kindred, 75 persons in all, a small number at that point. After 400 years, they would march out of Egypt with over a million people. 
Verse 15, it says, And Jacob went down to Egypt, the father of the nation. There's Father Israel. And Jacob went down into Egypt, and he died, he and our fathers. And they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham had bought for a sum of silver from the sons of Hamor and Shechem. Stephen's saying, look, you want to talk about the history of Israel? You want to talk about affirming the Old Testament, affirming the words of Moses? Let's go there. I'll start from beginning to the end and show you that I affirm every single word of Scripture all the way from the inception of God's call of Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees even to the point where God brought Israel and his 12 sons into Egypt and provided for them sovereignly, providentially in a land of difficulty, in a land of oppression. God is not bound to geography. God's presence is not bound to where you may or may not be. You do not have to be in Israel to worship God. It's the point that Stephen is making here. You do not have to be in Israel to worship God. That has been proven by our fathers here in the faith. But he goes on from Abraham to Joseph, now to Moses. Verse 17, but as the time of the promise, what promise was that? Genesis 15, when God told Abraham that his offspring would live in Egypt for 400 years, when that time, that promise was coming to an end. But as the time of the promise drew near, which God had granted to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt, blessings in a foreign land, until there arose over Egypt another king who did not know Joseph. That's probably Tutmose I of the 18th dynasty. It says in verse 19 that he dealt shrewdly with our race and forced our fathers to expose their infants so that they would not be kept alive. Shows unity again with them. He dealt shrewdly with our race and our fathers to do what? To commit one of the most heinous crimes in all of history. To command the Hebrews to expose their babies, to expose their sons out to the elements and let them die. They had to have a king force them to infanticide. People in this country that pay people for it. This is the greatest crime in Israel's history committed against them outside of the Holocaust. And yet the infanticide in America makes that pale into comparison. But God was with them in their darkest hour. He dealt shrewdly with our race and our and forced our fathers, verse 19, to expose their infants so that they would not be kept alive. At this time, Moses was born, and he was beautiful in God's sight. And he was brought up, look at the providence, the sovereign hand of God to rescue Moses. And he was brought up for three months in his father's house. And when he was exposed, Pharaoh's daughter, Pharaoh's daughter, her daddy's the one that said kill him. But Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and brought him up as her own son. And Moses supposed to be dead, but by God's providence, it says, was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in word and deeds. You remember when Moses, after these 40 years that he's going to spend in Midian in the wilderness, and God calls him out? You remember Moses's excuse? Moses said, Lord, I, I can't go back into Egypt and, and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. I, I can't tell him to do I can't do that, Lord. I don't speak well enough. You know what Abraham was doing? Or not Abraham, but Moses? He was lying. He was lying. He spoke perfectly fine. He was mighty in word. He was mighty in deeds. And as you read, God promised, he said, I'll send Aaron along with you, and Aaron will be your spokesman. But when you read the book of Exodus, who is the one speaking? It was Moses. We shouldn't lie to God. God knows the truth, doesn't he? It says in verse 23, when he was 40 years old, still a young man, depending on your perspective, right? When he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. God stirred Moses' heart. 
So it's time to leave. It's time to leave Pharaoh's palace. It's time to go and identify with your Hebrew brothers and sisters. God calls Moses out, just like he had called Abraham out, just like he had called Joseph out, and Moses is gonna answer that call by faith. Verse 24 says, and seeing one of them being wrong, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. What you'll start to notice here in this sermon of Stephen is that he is going to draw a parallel between the way Moses was sent to the people of God in Egypt and rejected by the Israelites and how Jesus came along much in like fashion to Moses and he was sent to the people of Egypt. Israel and he also was pushed aside. These very men who are now condemning Stephen, their fathers are the one who pushed Moses aside. They were the very ones who complained against Moses and said, let us go back to Egypt. Now they, when they look at the prophet of God, the son of God, Jesus, they look at him and say, we don't want you just like our fathers didn't want Moses. It says, they did not understand. Verse 26, And on the following day, he appeared to them as they were quarreling and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brothers. Why do you wrong each other? But the man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him aside, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? At this retort, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons, Gershom and Eleazar. Moses sent to the people of Israel as redeemer, as a savior of sorts for them. Do they accept him? No, they don't. They reject him, and he goes out into the wilderness, and he spends, it says in verse 30, 40 years. Now, when 40 years had passed, that means Moses is about 80 years old at this point. Now, when 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in a flame of fire in a bush. That's the angel of the Lord, the Lord Jesus, it would seem. Verse 31 says, when Moses saw it, he was amazed at the sight. And as he drew near to look, there came a voice of the Lord. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. And Moses trembled and did not dare look. Then the Lord said to him, take, off your, take the sandals off from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Stephen shows the utmost respect to God when he speaks of him. Stephen is not blaspheming the name of God. He is not disrespecting Moses, the call of Moses, nor the law of Moses. Verse 34, God says, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. And have heard their groaning, and I have come down to deliver them, and now come, I will send you to Egypt. This is going to be great. God is going to send salvation to his people. How are they going to treat this Redeemer who is sent to them? Look at the parallel he draws very strikingly now. Verse 35, this Moses whom they rejected, saying, who made you a ruler and a judge? This man God sent as both ruler and redeemer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. This man led them out, performing wonders and signs in Egypt at the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. You've got to ask these people who were following along Moses. You may not believe the words that Moses is saying, but would you at least believe the works that he is doing? Would you at least believe the miracles that he's doing? How the Red Sea parts, how water comes from a rock, how manna springs up from the ground, rains down as dew there on the ground. Would you at least believe the works of Moses? Because you know who he's comparing him to? He's comparing him to Jesus. That just as the Israelites saw all the miracles and wonders that Moses performed and they rejected Moses and they rejected God, so also the Sanhedrin that he is looking at, Stephen is looking at, they saw the miracles that Jesus performed. They were there. 
Many of them, I'm sure, were eating when Jesus fed the 5,000, when he fed the 10,000. Many of them were there, I'm sure, when he made the lame man to walk there, the paralytic that was lowered down through the roof, and he forgave his sins. Many of them were there when Jesus cast out demons and healed all manners of sickness, yet they refused to believe just like their fathers refused to believe the works of God through Moses. Continue looking here. It says in verse 37, this is the, Mo the Moses that you're talking about when you say that I'm aligned the word of Moses, this is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. He said, Moses even prepared you for Jesus. Moses prepared you to receive him, and you don't acknowledge the words of Moses. You see how he's turning the script on them now? They accuse him of maligning the words of Moses, and he shows them, it's not me who's rejected Moses. It's not me who has rejected God. It's not me who has blasphemed his name. You, he says to the Sanhedrin. Verse 38, this is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness. That word congregation, that's ecclesia, that's where we get our word for church. In the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers. We're still united in this. We still come from the same place. And he received living oracles. You see the respect that Stephen pays to the word of God? It says in Hebrews 4, 12, that the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. That's what Stephen is saying about the word of God delivered through Moses. It's living, it's active, sharper than any two-edged sword. He received the living oracles to give to us. Verse 39, our fathers refused to obey him and thrust him aside. And in their hearts, they turned to Egypt, saying to Aaron, make for us gods who will go before us. As for this Moses who led us out from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days and offered a sacrifice to the idol and were rejoicing in the works of their hands. But God turned away and gave them over to worship the host of heaven as it is written in the book of the prophets. He's saying, you had the commands of God. Your fathers had the commands of God. They saw the works of God. They saw the man of God in Moses. And that yet they rejected him from day one when he was sent to Egypt to redeem them. They rejected him for 40 years as they traveled there through the wilderness of Sinai. And so look at what Amos says here. That's what Stephen quotes from his mind. From his heart, Amos 5, 25 through 27, he says, God says to them, Did you bring me slain beasts and sacrifice during the 40 years in the wilderness as they wandered there leading up to the promised land? Oh, house of Israel. No, they didn't. He says, You took up the tent of Moloch and the star of the god of Rephan, the images that you made to worship, and I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. He says, rather than worship the God who parted the Red Sea for you, who washed over Pharaoh's army and put them to death, rather than worship him, you started worshiping stars. You started adopting the gods of these pagan nations. And notice the word of condemnation, the judgment that is handed down to the fathers of the Sanhedrin that are judging Stephen. He says, God does, and I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. Indeed, the people of Israel did go into exile in Babylon. I think the Holy Spirit through Amos is pointing to something even deeper than that. You remember where Abram began? When he began in Mesopotamia and Ur of the Chaldees? That is beyond Babylon. That is to the south of Babylon, to the edge of the Persian Gulf. You know what God's judgment was on Israel for their rejection of Moses' law, for their rejection of the wonders and signs that they saw through Moses. He says, I will take you and exile you back to the beginning. You will go all the way back to the start because you have rebelled from the start. They haven't acknowledged the law of Moses like they are claiming. Look at verse 44. Our fathers had the tent of witness. 
That is the place where the Ark of the Covenant, that was a box. It was a, it was a shipment container for the covenant of God, the word of God. And the tent was the place of worship. It was a movable uh, tent, a place of worship that they could take from place to place there in the wilderness, showing again, God is not bound to worship there in Jerusalem. They worshiped him all over the wilderness. Our fathers had the tent of witness in the wilderness, just as he who spoke to Moses, Exodus 38, directed him to make it according to the pattern that he had seen. Our fathers, in turn, brought it in with Joshua when they had dispossessed the nations that God drove out before our fathers. So it was until the days of David, who found favor in the sight of God and asked to find a dwelling place for the house of Jacob. David wants to build a temple to the Lord. Mighty David, chosen one of God, chosen king over Israel. Notice God's response here to David. David won't even get to worship in a temple that they're accusing Stephen of wanting to destroy. Verse 47, but it was Solomon who built the house for him. Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands. As the prophet says, Isaiah 66, 1 through 2, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things. They accuse him of wanting to destroy the temple because their life is bound up in that temple. Their life is bound up at what they do in church. And Stephen points out from beginning to the end, God has never been bound to the temple. God has never been bound to a building. God's presence is not restricted by your geography. In fact, he says, how can you contain God in a temple? God made the heavens and the earth. The earth is his footstool. You can't keep God in a building. You're not worshiping God, you're worshiping a temple. God's presence is not restricted by geography. But God's presence is certainly restricted by unbelief. Look at what Stephen says. They think they're worshiping God because they have the temple. Stephen says people have worshiped God long before there was ever a temple. You think you worship God because you're in the temple, but I want to show you where your heart really is. Verse 51, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. He says, you think you worship God because you have the temple. Your fathers have maligned the name of God from the beginning. You think that God is restricted by geography, but God's presence is not with you because you are not born again. You don't have a changed heart. You go to church, you go to the temple, you think God's there because it's a temple, but you don't realize that God demands. If his presence will be with you, it's gonna be because you have a changed heart. But you don't have a changed heart. You don't have an ear that hears. There are many people We've said all that to say this. There are many people who believe that because they come to church, they have communion with God. God's presence is not restricted to the geography of this building. But God is very far away from people who resist the Holy Spirit's call to follow Christ. We can come to a church building all we want, but what God demands from us is a softened heart, a changed heart, and an ear that will listen to God's word. So far from what their fathers had done, they malign God's word. They thrust it aside just like they did Moses when he was sent to Egypt. He says, you know what God wants you to do? God wants you to take his word and live it. God wants you to open your ear. God wants your heart to be changed. He wants your life to be changed. If you want the presence of God, you have to have a changed heart, he says. 
You stiff-necked people. He likens them exactly the same way that God did in Exodus 33. He says, you are stiff-necked people. And the picture that he gives them is that of an ox or a horse that you would strap a yoke on their neck and you would get them to work for the master. But he says, this is the way you are. You are like a stubborn donkey. You are a stubborn mule, a stubborn horse. You bow up your shoulders and you refuse to work to the Lord. You are not a slave to the Lord. You are cumbersome to him. You refuse to work for the Lord. You refuse to obey the Lord. You refuse to follow him just like your fathers refused to follow Moses. These men are not going to be too happy about hearing this message at all. It says, as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? You notice how in this section he has distanced himself. He says, everything about us is the same. Where we came from, what we were told to do, everything about us is the same except one thing. Stephen says, we believe the commands of God. And all the commands of God point to Jesus. You, on the other hand, have rejected the commands of God from day one, and it has culminated in the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus. Every one of us is the same. We all come from Adam and Eve. We are all born of parents. We all live in this world. We all sin against God. The difference comes with what you do with Jesus. You either come to that edge and you accept the Lord Jesus, forgiven of sins, given everlasting life, or you reject the Lord Jesus and you are an inheritor of God's wrath as you deserve. He says in verse 30, 52, which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one. He says, if you would have listened to the word of God by the prophets, you would have been prepared for Jesus, whom you now betrayed and murdered, you who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. He brings them to a point of decision here. Will they soften their heart and repent and begin to follow after Jesus, or will they reject? Look at, their, look at their response here, and you'll see. Verse 54 says, Now when they heard these things, they were enraged. It literally says that their heart was cut in two. The word penetrated their heart. That's never the question. The word of God penetrates people's heart. The question is, what do you do once it's penetrated your heart? Once you come to a point of decision, it says they were cut to the heart. They were enraged. Look at their response. They don't follow Jesus. They don't repent. It says, and they ground their teeth at him like an angry, whiny five-year-old. But they are grown adults who are just being rebellious. They ground their teeth at him. Look at verse 55. The work of the Holy Spirit in Stephen's darkest hour But he, full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. In Stephen's life, right then and there, it's the work of the Holy Spirit even today. When the Holy Spirit works on your heart, he will take your eyes from looking at everything in the world and he will point you upward to look at Jesus and to see him rightly as an authority figure, the authority authority figure over you, seated at the right hand of God. So there's Stephen in the midst of the lion's den, the Sanhedrin all around him, their teeth literally grinding because of their anger. They are salivating for Stephen's blood, and yet Stephen is right there having a worship service. He is not alone. As I said last week, to be alone with God is to have a majority of one. There's Stephen in the midst of the lion's den seeing Jesus, just as Daniel was. Verse 56, and he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. They couldn't say anything to the truth of what he said. So what they did was this. Don't talk to me anymore. 
I'm not going to go to that church anymore. I'm not going to read my Bible anymore. I'm not going to listen to that sermon anymore. Not because I disagree with it, but because I rebel against it. That is the point of decision that God's word brings a man to. You cannot argue against it, but you have the choice to accept or reject it. And so they plug their ears. Look at this picture. These dignified men, all 70 of them, garbed in their teacher's garments as rabbis, distinguished men. They are grinding their teeth, plugging their ears. Look at what it says. But they cried out with a loud voice, verse 57, and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. We'll learn a lot about Saul in the coming months and indeed for the rest of our lives. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, listen to this, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He's quoting from Psalm 31, verse 5. You remember there in Luke chapter 23, verse 46, as Jesus is hanging on the cross and he is about to die, it says that he looks into heaven and he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Look at what Stephen is doing. He's substituting someone. Instead of saying, Father, he says, Lord Jesus, into your hands I commit my spirit. He entrusts himself completely to the Lord Jesus in his greatest hour of need. Which I would implore everyone, trust in Jesus in your greatest hour of need and see the reward. See the reward. The Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus receive my spirit and falling to his knees as these stones are plumbing him. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against him. That's the very same prayer that Jesus prayed for his crucifiers there in Luke 23, 34. Lord, do not hold this sin against him. That is the grace of God towards sinners. You don't understand what you do. Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they don't understand what they do. Look at the reward for Stephen for trusting in God. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. What a beautiful picture there. Doesn't seem beautiful. This man has just been stoned to death brutally by grown men gnashing their teeth. This is a heinous picture. But Stephen dying such a tragic death, Luke records that he fell asleep. You know why Luke does that? Luke does that because the faith of Stephen lay hold to the promise of God. The promise of God to those who believe in the Lord Jesus is that he'll forgive them of their sins and he will raise them up from the dead. So someone who dies with their faith in Christ, they're asleep. And they will wake up from that. At the trumpet blast when Jesus, who is at the right hand of God, is sent to the earth, God will raise the dead in Christ and they will live forever. That is the promise of God. But it doesn't come to people who just go to church. It doesn't come to people who think that they're going to get blessed by God because they have attained to some sort of geography. They're in the church, they're in the temple, or if they give lip service and say, I believe in the law of Moses, or I believe in God. No, no, no. The presence of God is not restricted by geography, but he is far away from those who resist the Holy Spirit's call to new life in Christ. The only thing, after hearing this, the only thing that will keep a person from heaven who has just heard this will be their rejection of the grace of God offered to them. Would you pray with me?